Uh, today is an executive briefing with uh, former NTSB Chair Robert Zumwalt and HAI President uh, Jim Viola. We do appreciate uh, that you took time out of your schedule to join us. I uh, basically have already given you who our first speakers are, but let me go ahead and go through them real quick. We have uh, Jim Viola, the President and CEO of HAI. And we have the Honorable Robert Zumwalt, who is the, now a Distinguished Fellow in Aviation Safety and an Executive Director of the Embry-Riddle Center for Aviation and Aerospace Safety. Our webinars are interactive. If this is the first time you've joined us, we encourage you to ask questions. Please use the question module that's within Zoom. Um, it should either be on the bottom of your screen or on the side somewhere. Um, we do pay attention to chat, but we absolutely want to make sure that we get your questions uh, towards the end of the webinar today uh, for Mr. Sumwalt. Uh, these webinars are being recorded. We are also doing a, a live stream. Um, it's being live streamed on Facebook and on LinkedIn today. Uh, the recording for today's webinar will be available within about 24 hours. We'll have that posted to our YouTube channel and to our website. We'll try to make those uh, links available just as soon as possible. Uh, you're encouraged to share them, go back and uh, record, uh, view anything you might have missed as well. And now I'd like to go ahead and invite uh, Jim Viola to uh, join me on screen. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, glad to be able to kick things off. We've got a special guest today, of course, uh, the Honorable Robert Summel. Uh, he joined Emory Riddle, uh, where he'll be talking to us from today, the Aeronautical University, in January of uh, 2022, so just last month, as a distinguished fellow in the Aviation Safety and Executive Director of the Emory Riddle Center of Aviation and Aerospace Safety. And I know all of our callers on here are familiar with Emory Riddle for sure and aviation, they go together very well. Previously, where most people know him from, and I've certainly had the opportunity of my days in the FAA to come across him several times as speaker. Uh, he was the chairman and the vice chairman and also a member of the National Transportation Safety Board. He served there from uh, August of 20, uh, 2006 through June of uh, 2021. So just last year, and he was appointed by three presidents, both George Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. While serving on the NTSB, uh, the Honorable uh, Robert Summelt was involved in the deliberation and determination of probable cause with the NTSB does for over 250 transportation accidents, and not only in aviation, but across all modes of transportation, pipeline, rail, aviation, hazardous materials, highway, and marine. So he's very, uh, familiar with all kinds of uh, things that need to be done in the safety world. And as chairman, he provided strong leadership that established the vision and values and goals for the agency with help, which certainly helped advance the NTSB standing to be listed, you know, when I was in the FAA, as the, the NTSB was listed as the best place to work in federal government. So uh, that was through his leadership. The Honorable Sumwell also flew actively for 32 years, including 24 years with a major US-based international airline. He has co-authored a book on aviation accidents and has published more than 100 articles on transportation safety and aircraft accident investigation. Mr. Sumwalt earned an undergraduate degree from the University of South Carolina and a master's of aeronautical science with distinction from the Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University with concentrations in aviation and aerospace safety systems and human factors aviation systems. We know those are key to a lot of the accidents. He is a proud recipient of honorary doctorates from Emory Riddle and the University of South Carolina. In recognitions of his contribution to the aviation industry, Honorable Summel was awarded the Flight Safety Foundation Boeing Aviation Safety Lifetime Achievement Award. And he also received the Flight Safety Foundation's Laura Talver Bobber Award in 2003 and ALPA's Air Safety Award in 2005. He is inductee of the South Carolina Aviation Hall of Fame. Our Honorable Robert Summel, would you please join me on the camera? There you have it. Yeah, well, thanks. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much. Now, I, I know that uh, you're just getting settled in and uh, in your warmer weather down, uh, down in Florida, so that's pretty good. I'm, I'm actually just um, just north of Jacksonville right now on uh, Amelia Island, Fernando Beach, uh, doing a little bit of R44 flying, um, heading down to Florida, get a little warmer weather, and also get to see my grandkids. And, uh, and I've, I've shared some pictures of, uh, yeah, I call it workforce development, as I uh, introduced uh, the young younger generation to some of the good things with helicopters. So well, we, uh, we I'd like to open up, go ahead. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. No, go right ahead. Thanks. We look forward to uh, welcoming your um, your grandkids to uh, Emory Riddle in a few years. There you have it. Exactly. Um, they they are very uh, they're very good, and I think uh, you know that's a great great school for sure. Uh, any opening statements before I jump in on a couple questions? No, it's uh, great to be with you, and really thank you, uh, thank you, and the HAI uh, for all of the good work that you're doing to advance and promote. Uh, uh, helicopter safety. So thanks for uh, thanks for all you're doing there. Well, I mean, a lot of the work that you've done over the past many years with the NTSB, uh, you know, with the recommendations, uh, you know, the, the way that the NTSB works and that you got to lead the organization of going out unconstrained and, and being able to just make it a safer environment. Uh, I know my days in the FAA where, you know, it was overall safety, just as well, you had multiple modes. At the time with the FAA, you know, I had airplanes, helicopters, uh, ultralights, uh, EAA members, all this stuff. And I was really happy here in the last two years of, to narrow my focus to helicopters and vertical lift. And, uh, and I look forward to trying to make an impact in, in that segment of the aviation safety. And you had the breadth of all modes. So uh, a little bit about that, well, I'll, ask, I'll jump in then with, you know, aviation accidents have been occurring since, you know, since the beginning of aviation time, 1908. And many of them continue to happen for the same reason uh, a lot of it's the poor aeronautical decision making. And, you know, we keep trying to figure out how do you reach out and how do you get in the heads of those pilots to make safer decisions. What are, what are some of the thoughts you've had over the years of, or things you'd, you'd like to do if you could do that? Yeah, great question. And you're so right. So many bad things happen by poor decisions, whether it's uh, continuing into weather that a pilot should not be continuing into or or um, any of the other uh, decisions, many of which I've made myself. Uh, so if we can improve decision-making, and I've always felt that it was so important to make the correct no-go decision. If you make the wrong decision and you go, then, well, let's put it this way. If you make the correct decision to not go, you eliminate the possibility of making those fatal decisions downstream. and. Uh, as you pointed out, there's been a lot that's been done in aeronautical decision making. The uh, Embry Riddle, uh, that's one of the areas that we look forward to researching here at our new center. Um, and as you as you all know, uh, one year ago yesterday is when the NTSB wrapped up its uh, investigation of the Calabasas uh, accident that was, of course, two years ago. And one of our recommendations there was for scenario based training uh, that uh, pilots can uh, can can uh, and and Q based training back in 2010 or 2009 when the NTSB wrapped up our um, 23 recommendations for the what we then called HEMS operators now called uh, air ambulance uh, operators um, we recommended uh, Q based training where you can uh, show a pilot uh, in a simulator or now through virtual reality or even on a computer screen. Uh, you know, weather that may appear to be deteriorating, um, then we can, we can better train pilots for how to react when they encounter those situations. So uh, we do look forward to continued research on, in that area here at Embry-Riddle. And uh, so that's, you're right, if we can prevent the wrong go, no-go decision, then we can mitigate a lot of uh, errors that can come along downstream. Yeah, I think, you know, that decision or that ability to, to be the to actually, you know, I, I know I still do some uh, flight instruction and to try to teach the, the, the pilot that they can say no and when to say no and not and no to people that want, you know, that don't understand the, the hazard that they actually are, are trying to push the pilot to do. Or even, you know, when talking with ATC or anyone, you're the pilot, you're, you're out there in that, uh, you know, experience what's actually happening. And, and that those others are supposed to be there to help you. So, uh, you know, own the decision, make the decision, have an opportunity to say, well, I should have versus doing something wrong and, and not being able to, you know, not surviving the flight. And, uh, you know, and on the helicopter side, I constantly, you know, it, I think it gets a bad rap because a lot of times a helicopter accident always makes the front cover of the newspaper. Um, people are interested in, in seeing the, you know, what happened there. And it, it comes down to that, I think you were saying, the aeronautical decision-making of making a good decision that you can you know, have the opportunity to at least make another decision if you make a good decision of not flying that day 
or waiting on weather. What what do you in a scenario based training? Have you had the opportunity to look at our fifty six seconds to live video? Absolutely, and in fact, I had the pleasure of being one of the first to see it. You may recall it was uh, about a year ago that uh, when I was still at the board, and you did get on a mm -hmm. telecon a video call with us, and you you previewed for it, and that is such a sobering video and uh, great job on producing it um, and and I hope that it can uh, have the intended uh, uh, result. Yeah, I mean those those are the accidents that keep occurring as you mentioned I think you know the um, the ability to, to you, it's not it's nothing new. you're continuing flight into not VMC conditions, not visual lot you know you can't you can't see any longer and, and for some I'm not sure what goes through the pilot's mind of what they think is gonna happen. And we, that hopefully that video will do it ahead of time and, uh, and they'll make better decisions. But- uh, Well, absolutely. So and, and of course, in a helicopter, you oftentimes have an option that we didn't always have in an airplane. And that is, as the late Matt Zaccaro would say, just land the damn helicopter. And, uh, uh, but, but to get to that point in decision-making, I'm sure it goes through a lot of maturations. But if we can either make the right no-go decision or land the damn helicopter before we get into something uh, that we can't handle. Uh, the, each of those can go a, a long way towards, uh, towards improving safety and reducing the accident Absolutely. rate. Yeah, and as, as it progresses, you know, the, in a helicopter, you can't necessarily do this in an airplane, but when you go down, you go to, you're now flying at a lower altitude than you had planned to fly, or you now are slowing down because you can no longer see, that should be one, two, time to land a damn helicopter and then regroup. So yeah, thank you for that. And, uh, and I know that's a challenge and that's the, you know, the human factors of it, the decision-making of it. And I know you're going to do some good work with Emory Riddle with some of the bright, brilliant young uh, people that come down there and, and try to make aviation as safe as possible. Not that we want to stop people from flying. We want more people flying and we want them flying safer. So thanks. Yeah. And yeah, um... We, we look forward to partnering with the HAI to, to help direct where our research should be going. As uh, many of your viewers are aware, here at our Daytona campus, we only have fixed wing training, but at our Prescott campus, we have uh, fixed wing and helicopters. I think there's about 10 or 11 helicopters out there that we are training in uh, R-22s and R-44s. So, uh, and we've got uh, Professor Don, Don Grow, who is uh, uh, leading a lot of the safety efforts. She's serving on the U.S. HST. So uh, th there's, a, there's work that needs to be done. And I think it, it's best done when it's uh, done in a collaborative fashion uh, between having the right players, the industry, uh, academia, uh, labor, and, uh, and the government. When all of those can work together, we can really come up with some really good solutions. Yeah. And you mentioned the, the U.S. helicopter safety team. And, and uh, you know, on the helicopter side, again, I, I thank your, your leadership from the NTSB and allowing the NTSB to participate in those you know, government and industry safety related teams that, that are trying to figure out how do we make it as safe as possible. So thanks for that. Thank so you. the second question I have, what, what do you consider, I mean, there's gotta be one thing that hangs back there in the back of your mind that, that uh, you accomplished during your time in NTSB that, that is you're most proud of, or, or at least you feel good about. What is that one that stands out? Well, I know there's, there's so many, but there's gotta be something that you're really proud of. Uh, probably the fact that I didn't get fired. Uh, that's probably uh, one of the biggest th accomplishments. The truth of the matter is, Jim, uh, and, and I think you'll appreciate this, uh, nothing that I've ever done alone has, has, has ever happened. Uh, anything that, that, that I may have been involved with has, has only been successful due to the result of working with some fine people. And so uh, the NTSB really does have very dedicated uh, men and women who work there, they, they love their jobs. Uh, and so I think that's been the, the, the biggest thing that I'm the most proud of is, is looking back and having the opportunity to work with those uh, dedicated workers. Okay, no, that's great. I mean, I know you've got, a, you've got a pretty good team and it's a small team. A lot of people probably don't understand how small the NTSB is, <laughs> but, um, but they all are, are very, uh, very expertise uh, in their areas. So thanks for that. Well, one of the things that I think maybe a lot of people might be familiar with is that most wanted list and the most wanted list, you know, 
can you kind of explain what that is and how it developed and, and, and how you go through that every year? Yeah, the NTSB uh, in 1990, which was, uh, was long before I got there, uh, did uh, form the most wanted list. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it grew over time. It was an annually updated uh, list. It grew over time, I think, uh, by about 2014, there were maybe 23 issue areas that were on the most wanted list. And we regrouped and said it should have uh, no more, no fewer than five and no more than 10. So between five and 10 items on it, how can you effectively advocate for 20 items? So, you know, if everything's important, I think Nick Sabatini used to say, if everything's important, then nothing's important. So we, we did scale it down and really tried to focus on those 10 areas. It went from being a, an annual list to a biennial event, so every two years. Um, and then in uh, two years ago, uh, March of 2020, the GAO uh, recommended that we come up with a more uh, well-defined methodology for how things went on, came and left the list. And they suggested that that be a very transparent uh, way of, of doing business. And so the staff came up with a criteria that, was, that the board adopted. Uh, and I'll just look at the list. It was four criteria that we really would use to measure and weigh what would come and go off the list. Level of validation, and meaning how much, how valid is this issue? Is it just something that one person is wanting or is it, um, is it this an industry issue? Uh, the level of action, um, it, it, has there been adequate action on this particular issue? The level of risk and consequence. And finally, the potential benefit from putting it on the list. Uh, can we really move the needle uh, by putting this on the list and, and to make, hmm. make it clear, the list is, is for those areas that we felt needed greater attention to, to really push them over the edge to get them implemented. So that was, that's the real purpose of the list right there. Okay, so, we, so it certainly highlights, and I like some of those criteria there, the ability to actually get something done, yeah. um, and that, that's good. Any anything else on the on the most wanted list? No, unless you want to drill down on that a little bit. The last board meeting on that, the, the list was adopted on, I think it was on uh, April the sixth of last year. So it's about halfway through, about midway through its cycle. So about this time next year, um, the board would be uh, coming up with a with another uh, with a revised list. So the, it, there is no, you know, there has to be so many from aviation, has to be so many from highways or anything. You know, that's a great question. And that was something that was uh, sort of debated. Uh, you know, what, what should we do? If you really looked at the number of fatalities, you'd, you'd only have highway related things on there. So we did feel, at least my, my feeling is, is that really it should be represented across the modes that the NTSB is, is, is devoted to working on the, the five modes, even including pipeline. Uh, but that's up to the board philosophically to, to debate. Uh, but I feel like our, our mandate was to investigate accidents in all modes. So therefore, the, the list should reflect a couple of items uh, on, on uh, a couple of items per mode. And, and uh, uh, as you know, there's two, I believe there's two items currently on the list that are aviation related, although directly aviation related. Uh, there's other things, uh, for example, uh, fatigue. Now that's not currently on the list, but fatigue affects all modes of transportation. Uh, um, uh, fitness for duty, that affects uh, all modes of transportation. So when I say there's only two items related to aviation, I mean two items specifically related to aviation, but I think there were about five or seven that had tentacles uh, in, in all of the modes. No, but no, thanks for that. And I, I do want to pull on one of those threads that you mentioned. Because uh, I'm super proud. I'm proud of my team, your team, FAA, with the accidents, uh, the rate of, of accidents in aviation. I mean, as you mentioned there, when you look at highways, um, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement there. And some of the other modes of transportation, you know, have some room for improvement. But we've become to the point where aviation accidents, and we should be, are unacceptable. You know, the, uh, the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team and VAST, Vertical Aviation Safety Team, zero fatal accidents being the goal, just same as as cast, I know your involvement in cast was was as a leader was certainly welcome. 
I don't know if you want to touch on cast and how, I mean, just the fact of overall, the work that has been done in aviation to get where we are today. And we continue to go for zero, which is, which is the right answer. Well, thanks. And I was never personally directly involved with the CAST uh, and uh, commercial aviation safety team, uh, but uh, we did have NTSB reps that would attend. Um, and, and as you well know, the uh, CAST received the Collier Trophy uh, 2008, 2009 timeframe. And uh, it really was, uh, it, it continues to be an effort that is looking for, uh, looking for areas of improvement and then developing an implementation plan to to drive those accidents and incidents down. It's been a very successful um, effort. And as you know, uh, I think the goal was to reduce, I forget the, the metric, it was either fatalities or total accidents, whatever it was, there was an 80% figure there to drive accidents or fatalities, whichever the metric was, to drive it down by 80% over, over a decade. And I think they, they pretty much hit that. And uh, so there's a lot of success there. And I know that the US HST is uh, somewhat modeled on, on the cast. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that, that is correct. And it was the same, same deal. They tried to go 80% in 10 years on, on the helicopter specific. And of course, in 2016, that was the 10 year mark, which we didn't meet the metric, but we continue to go towards the zero fatal accidents now. Absolutely. If you, even if you don't hit your goal, you were successful in the fact that you have driven that, that right down. So, so keep yes. up, uh, don't uh, lose, uh, lose faith there. And again, congratulations to everyone who's been involved in that uh, extensive effort. Yeah. And so on, on that with the, the, you know, the evolution of the international helicopter safety team to the international helicopter safety foundation, which was a vision of Matt Sakaros. <laughs> And then now, you know, what I've done in the last few years, we kind of transitioned it to the vertical aviation safety team. And we want to make sure that there, our doors are open for an all vertical lift to, and you know, helicopters certainly are a big part of that right now, but we want to make sure we're open to the future. And, and with that, I'd like to ask you a question about the global, global collaboration that you've had with other safety boards around the world. Yeah, back uh, probably, well, somewhere during Jim Hall's tenure on the board. So, you know, Jim was the chairman from 2004 to 2000, early 2001. And so um, uh, somewhere in that time frame, uh, uh, he and others across the globe formed ITSA, ITSA, the International Transportation Safety Association, which is made up now of about 18 uh, accident investigation authorities across the globe. Uh, it would meet, uh, it's a meets annually. The last two years, are, unfortunately, have been uh, virtual, but uh, we would meet and, and they still will meet uh, um, every year uh, to exchange ideas because it's amazing. Uh, uh, the U.S. didn't invent everything and uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. And, and we're not the only ones that have, has challenges. It's amazing to go to these meetings and hear that across the globe, other accident investigation authorities are facing the same challenges and uh, are trying to uh, accomplish the same things. And so it's a, it's, it's a wonderful networking opportunity in a very small group to be able to, uh, um, to, to, to learn from others. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, the, in the vertical aviation safety team now with the, uh, with the international calls that we have, and, and it is the same issues, um, you know, around the globe. It just kind of, you know, as you shift from Northern hemisphere to Southern hemisphere, where the only real difference is uh, who's under the winter, who's got the cold weather that time of the year, but the, the problems are all the same. And uh, it really is great to collaborate. And that's one of the things that, you know, we reached out and we just did a collaboration with the European Helicopter Association, <coughs> trying to make sure that, uh, you know, again, there's, there's the same issues on this side of the ocean as there are uh, in Europe and, and anything we can do to keep the, the safety ball rolling with the communication is, you know, it seems to be working for all of us. So, well, absolutely, and I certainly certainly did not invent this phrase, uh, but safety has no boundaries. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It, it's really good when people, you know, bring to the table uh, the things that are happening, and if you're at that table with that global environment, and they others have been through it, and this is what we did, and that, yeah. so. You don't have to, and so trying to get proactive in there is certainly one. And 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 with that, you know, I know on the proactive side and what we're trying to do to reduce uh, the accidents, 
you know, there has been some uh, criticism with the NTSB's call for cockpit voice recorders. Yeah. And I was wondering what, you know, what, what do you have to say on that when they say it wouldn't prevent an accident, but it would help with the investigation? Well, I certainly think the entire purpose of accident investigation is preventing future accidents. So uh, it would be a shame to endure an accident and think we have solved it, but not really solved it, not really gotten to the underlying issue. And um, um, so that the purpose of accident investigation is to prevent future accidents. Uh, years ago, uh, before I joined the, uh, the board, uh, there was a, uh, an S-76 uh, accident in Estonia. And that airplane, that, excuse me, that helicopter did have uh, some sort of flight data recorder on it. And, uh, and by, by, because of that, um, the investigators were able to figure out what the issue was. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, they could have come up and said, well, I think it was a, an, uh, an issue with, a, with an actuator is what I think it, it was. Again, that was before my time and it was in a foreign country, but the NTSB was, was involved in it. And, and, you know, the investigators could have said, well, it was a, a pilot disorientation or something. Whereas in reality, it was a mechanical issue there. So um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've made a living flying for, uh, for three decades. And, uh, um, you know, I, so, so I am or was a pilot. So um, um, I, it wouldn't bother me. I mean, I flew around with an airline as an airline pilot for 24 years and had a cockpit area mic right up here. And uh, if anything, it, uh, I tried to be very cognizant of the fact that that mic was there. And if there was a sterile cockpit rule, which there is, no talking, you know, in below, in the airliner case, below 10,000 feet, no, not no talking, no non-pertinent conversation below 10. Um, you know, I, I was very aware of that. So therefore I followed the rules. I've read too many cockpit voice recorded transcripts and frankly heard too many CVRs um, to, to, uh, to cringe when I saw all of those violations going on. So I think it, I, I think that, that it, it certainly, um, from an accident investigation perspective, it helps investigators to do their jobs, which ultimately prevents accidents. And, and from a piloting point of view, I think it uh, should help pilots remember that there really is somebody sitting over your shoulder, uh, maybe listening uh, to what you're saying, not on a routine basis, uh, you know, most of the airline pilot unions have, have said this device is only to be used for accident or incident investigation. It's not to be pulled for disciplinary purposes or, uh, or um, anything like that. So I think as long as it's used in the right context, uh, it, can, it, can, uh, it can work well. Yeah, I think, uh, well, then I'll, I'll throw in, throw in the, the T word, the training. I think a lot of times, you know, people get into a good culture and good systems where you're even using it to verify the training is working as you hoped it will, or, or when you're building those training programs to figure out what, what isn't transitioning to the cockpit that you want it to transition and kind of like a, a check and balance per se. Absolutely. I, I, I can only imagine. And of course, we're doing a lot of neat things here that I don't even know about yet at Emory Riddle. I've only been here about five weeks, but in, in the training environment, we've got 76 airplanes here in Daytona Beach and a number in Prescott, um, and as well as the, the helicopters. Um, I, I mean, they're able to almost, as soon as they land, download that flight and go back and replay it at a computer to see um, how they did. And, and so I would think that'd be a wonderful training tool, but also from a flight data monitoring perspective, you know, uh, with FDM, you really want to look at more of the systems issues uh, and not the individual pilot performance to say, gosh, look, we're having a problem with, with um, in the case of an airplane, you know, unstabilized approaches. Uh, and then we figure out, well, air traffic control is holding the airplanes up too high. And so the, their pilots aren't having time to get configured. That's really a systems issue that you can correct. You're not out so much to say, well, Robert Sumwalt is doing this. You know, he's screwing all, right. all, all this up. So, um, so I think that, yeah, there's got to be tremendous opportunities from a training perspective through some sort of flight data uh, program, as well as a, as a broader issue on an FDM basis. Yeah, no, the, uh, I have to 
uh, stabilized approaches has been something that you know we've been talking about for years and, and it was a you know, of course you know in the 121 the airline community uh, it's very very important and it's uh, i mean it's 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 like you're guaranteeing success and then when we tried to transition it i remember with the ga jsc the general aviation joint steering committee tried to transition to the ga and everybody was talking about no way you can't do it i got different airplanes i got different airspeed and all we're really talking about, and the same thing with helicopters, the same thing, because we're looking now at, you know, ISO audits, and, and you have to have a stabilized approach. There should be no reason to just come in and try to pull it all together at the end. It should be nice and stable. There's going to be a little bit different technique. Each helicopter is going to have a different vibe as you're coming in. When do you know you're going to do the go around? You need that in helicopters as well. Uh, are these future vehicles? I mean, that's the stuff, you know, we'll be working with, uh, with airports, you know, as we try to come up with design criteria for heliports and vertiports and all that for the future, but it has to be a stabilized approach. It Absolutely. You know, you, you, you look at the airline safety record uh, over the last decade or last uh, two decades, and uh, it's been a, a very good accident record and certainly knock on, on wood. And I attribute that to several things, uh, but one would be through the, we talked about the, uh, the cast. The cast has looked for areas and worked to come up with solutions to, to improve safety. But also I think these flight data monitoring programs at the airlines have helped significantly. Um, every major airline in the country uh, has a, uh, uh, well, every, well, I know the majors do, and I think all the regionals do at this point. So, you know, they've got flight data monitoring. They're able to look at, at those systemic issues. And I think that a combination of the, both of those things, the CAST and the flight data monitoring programs, um, I think that, that that takes care of a large reason of why uh, airline safety has, has uh, improved dramatically over the last two decades. And I know, you know, on the safety side, you know, there's a lot of work that gets done behind the scenes. And, you know, when I happened to be uh, uh, the Deputy Associate Administrator for Aviation Safety temporarily under Ali Barami, I did get to go to a couple of the CAST meetings and it was very eye-opening, as, just as you said, it's stuff that uh, because of those flight data monitoring, they can see what wasn't supposed to happen. And then all that, everyone gets together for the solution to continually look for areas to get better and better and better. Yeah. Uh, instead of just status quo. So no, great, great work being done there. And so a lot of that ties into technology, technology in the cockpit. Uh, it makes it easier to fly or is it, is it creating, you know, potentially sensory overload? You know, I certainly think there's that, that potential. Um, I, I would say that uh, certainly um, in, improved technology has, has been another factor that has helped to improve aviation safety. Uh, you look at each generation of airplanes going back through the jet age, you know, and how we've all seen that chart where in 1958, the accident rate was here and then it came down and kind of went like this and it's kind of bottomed out on the baseline now. And with each successive generation of airplanes, um, there has been a, a, lower, a, a lower initial hump in accidents and the recovery time uh, over the years, that that accident rate is able to come down to the baseline much sooner with each successive uh, introduction of of, um, of newer generation airplanes. So I think that technology uh, has really helped us, uh, but there is the issue of automation complacency, uh, as we saw in the uh, automation complacency and distractions. Now, I'm not currently flying. That's my greatest contribution to aviation safety these days, is my mind not flying. Uh, but, I, you know, these, these new flight instruments, uh, you know, I think it's a lot of push button and all, and some, some designs you have to go down a couple of levels to search for things. I think that could create a distraction. Um, but I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think if automation is used optimally, uh, it can continue to improve uh, safety for us. We, we did see in the, uh, in the Asiana crash that um, there was a, an over-reliance on automation. The pilots were expecting the automation to do something that it was not designed to do. So um, 
another thing, another thing we, we look forward to researching here in our safety center is, is flight deck design. And uh, so there's, you know, there's still work that can be done there. I'm going to mute my, my, my mic for a second, just so I can uh, cough, excuse me. Certainly. <clears throat> and uh, drink some more of mine. All right. Yeah. So on the technology side, you know, there's that uh, the automation and then just pure technology. I mean, I, I was, I transitioned from, you know, all the steam gauges to a glass cockpit. You know, I was flying in the army with the uh, Chinooks is where we went to all glass cockpit. And I know as we transitioned, um, you know, there was the issue was that it allowed my, and this was my, uh, you know, working with my, my safety officer was that uh, everybody could set up the cockpit a little different because oh. you can get actually, and you can conform it. And I saw that as a safety challenge. Uh, and so we standardized what you should have displayed on the HUD, what you should, should have displayed on your on your PFD and MFD, just because I didn't want people in their heads down trying to determine a different look. And, and then also a way, you know, the military so that we can enforce what it should look like. And I'm not sure how much configuration changes happen in the uh, in that in the 121 world in the airline industry with that glass cockpit, but but that's what uh, some of the the uh, safety officers did in the military was actually go out and look at the 121 world and that transition because uh, it is quite a quite a transition to go to all glass and then some of the future vehicles and you'll see hopefully uh, hopefully be able to make our show in, in Dallas but in Dallas we'll have some of the uh, the new equipment out there I'm sure a lot of the glass cockpits um, when I, I just um, in the early December walked through Robinson factory uh, with the administrator and just just telling him about some of the opportunities on how the new helicopters coming off, you know, you got the uh, Sikorsky, Leonardo, Airbus. I mean, these helicopters that are coming off the line now are just as complicated. Um, I don't mean complicated, but the technology is there to go zero, zero from takeoff to landing. And so that challenges the training to follow it and make it safe. And also it even challenges, you know, the FAA as far as infrastructure to be able to get off from the ground, you know, New York, Los Angeles, those areas. And I think uh, I don't, we've probably had this conversation before, but I know I've had it with Bruce Landsberg of, you know, if you've got an IFR, IMC equipped aircraft, then you ought to be, you know, using the system and the system ought to work for us as well. Yeah. So that we don't have to be going VFR. VFR allows you to, you know, to, to you know, I'm not sure, you know, VFR, if you're a VFR only aircraft, then you're out enjoying the day. But, uh, but the capability that's coming and the technology that's added now to these new aircraft I think they do increase the safety if you allow it to. Exactly, exactly. So great promise there. And uh, so uh, um, look forward to uh, HAI members and others, uh, member organizations to continuing to develop uh, technology, but not technology for the sake of technology, but uh, technology that truly can enhance safety. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, what they required, you know, as a kind of as a follow up to that on the technology and the automation, uh, you know, the pilot skills, the ability now with simulators, I mean, what are your thoughts on deteriorating pilot skills based on automation? Or is that some of the stuff that you're actually studying down there? Well, you know, there's certainly the possibility of it deteriorating uh, over time. I, I knew that that autopilot of mine uh, could, could continue to fly the airplane very well. Uh, but I wasn't sure about my skills. So I, I, I flew the airplane a lot more than a lot of pilots uh, with the airline because I didn't want to forget those skills. But uh, maybe, I, maybe I should have uh, used the autopilot more. Passengers would have appreciated it probably instead, instead of all this. But um, um, I mean, again, back to the Asiana crash, we, we came out, we being the NTSB, came out with a recommendation that, uh, that pilots uh, needed to... Uh, to have a little bit more uh, hands-on experience so that they didn't uh, deteriorate. Uh, those skills uh, did not deteriorate. I did notice that there was a, a, a draft uh, advisory circular that the FAA put out um, week before last on flight path ma management. And, um, and it, it talked about uh, pilots may not be getting enough stick time. So again, this is a draft advisory circular. Uh, not sure what the final version will ultimately look like, but the idea was is that we can't just sit there and uh, and let the automation let our skills erode. Um, you know, is the answer to that is an easy answer to that? Uh, uh, maybe the virtual reality. 
we're, we're doing a lot of work here at Ember Riddle on, on virtual reality, putting pilots in, uh, in just a, you know, basically a, a simu simulated looking flight deck with, with TV screens around so they, uh, so they can have uh, the experience of flying without uh, actually going out and flying. And, and so I think there's a lot of promise to, to allow pilots to continue to uh, maintain their, their, uh, their proficiency. But it is a perishable skill, and so yeah. you bring up a good point. Is that something that uh, that we should worry about? And I think the answer is yes. It needs to be on our radar. Yeah, I, on the training and the flying off, and I was concerned, and I'm not sure if the numbers, how the numbers actually worked out. But you know, with the whole pandemic, where people just weren't going out, weren't flying enough, um, and then and then it seemed like right now, I think the flight schools are doing very well because uh, you know. Number one, we got workforce development. We're after you know the shortages that were were there two years ago are still there. You know as everybody ramps back up, um, so it's good to see that. And hopefully the accident rate doesn't go with it. You know as we start flying more. Right. So if you had uh, one change to make while you were at NTSB, or now that you look back, what would any changes that you would make or tweak? Well, yeah, and uh, and this was something that we were actively working on, and that is the timeliness of reports. Um, uh, we we uh, we we developed a, a, a ARTP accident ARTP uh, accident reduction timeliness project, I guess is what ARTP stood for, or a timeliness project. Um, it, it, the idea is that, that over over time. There's been sort of some mission, mission creep with accident reports. It's taken longer and longer and longer and longer. And if there's a reason for that, then I've always said that we don't want to rush an investigation. Um, it needs to take as long as it needs to take, but not a day longer. And um, and some of these reports have, have just gone on longer than, than I was comfortable with them going. And so uh, we spent about a year um, looking over uh, the year 2019, looking over our processes for our general aviation accidents and saying, how can, what are the, what are the pinch points here? Uh, are, is there any fat here? Are there ways that we can eliminate the, um, the fat? And so we took a lean six sigma approach to look for those areas and see how we could be more, more efficient. We, we rolled that out. We went to uh, Oshkosh in March of two years ago and actually had uh, trained our general aviation investigators uh, the first week in March. It was wonderful to be at Oshkosh in the summer uh, for air adventure, but it's pretty cool to be in that museum where you're the only people in it. You can wander around and, uh, yeah. and so we trained our folks. We departed uh, Washington on March the 6th, I'm sorry, departed Oshkosh on Friday, March the 6th of two years ago. And then we know that on Wednesday, March the 11th, a, a global pandemic was declared. So um, we, uh, we continue to use those processes. Okay. And I think over time, uh, now that we're sort of open back up again from a societal perspective, I think that we will start to see those, uh, those benefits of, of reducing the timeliness of the investigations. Again, uh, nobody wants to rush an investigation. It needs to take as long as it takes, but, uh, but, but again, not a day longer. So that's one of the things that I think all of us were working collectively on. And, uh, and I think that the, the agency will have some success on, in that. No, I appreciate that. And I know, you know, we've had a great relationship with yourself and, and other board members and, uh, and certainly HAI would continue to help in anything involved with the vertical flight um, helicopters or other uh, vehicles in the future as we go through that. Because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the timeliness of it, and I've talked to my challenges, uh, both on the communication side as well as the safety side, you know, when we see those accidents out there involving the accident, involving a helicopter, um, and you know it's uh, the aeronautical decision-making that just did not go right, but yet the general public see it as helicopters are unsafe. And, right. I, and I try to figure out how can I help, number one, educate the public that this was a bad decision on the aeronautical decision making, because we already got enough facts of, uh, of the accident that happened, you know, because we know the, bad, the weather was bad, they shouldn't have been there, they hit a wire in the fog, 
um, you know, how do you, how do, how do we, uh, I'm not sure, but I'm watching my words here on purpose, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, because it is all about education. Number one, you know, my message is, you know, we want, to, we want the industry to be as safe as possible so they can be prosperous. We want right. to provide the vertical lift element to society. We don't want society to think that helicopters are unsafe because they're not unsafe. They're great vehicles that are built by the OEMs. Um, and it's, it's uh, that human part that, uh, that you know, we have to worry and the training word is certainly big. And so I think I'll use that as a tie-in, you know, to we beat around the bush a little bit. Tell me about your role with Emory Riddle and what you're, you know, what you're looking forward to doing down there. Well, I'd love to, but let me back up just for a second when you talked about the collaboration between HAI and uh, and the NTSB. I remember back, um, well, gosh, well, the NTSB, of course, as you'll recall, had a, a, a public hearing uh, on uh, an investigative hearing. A public hearing is what we called it at the time uh, on on HIMSS, a four day public hearing, and I I uh, chaired that. And uh, this is early 2009, and the HIMSS industry had just finished a, a pretty. Uh, uh, an unglamorous period as it related to uh, to accidents, and so uh, the USHST and maybe even the IHS, the International HST, uh, came in to meet with us uh, to say we're trying to extract information from accident reports, but we're finding that some of these accident reports, NTSB reports, aren't. Um, aren't robust enough, don't have enough granularity. And they said, these are some additional things that we would like to see collected uh, as it relates to helicopter crashes. And so we incorporated those things in a checklist um, to make sure that we were capturing, getting those pieces of data. And that was because of that collaboration between uh, the industry, in this case, HAI, and the helicopter safety teams and the NTSB. So I wanted to point that out. So, Thank you. Thank you yeah. for that. Um, what, what am I doing here at Emory Road? Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, we're setting up, it's, it's, it's uh, in the process of setting up a, a center for aviation and airspace, air, aerospace safety. Uh, they've asked me to come in and, and lead that effort. Uh, we're just in the early stages of standing it up, but basically there's four pillars. There's the uh, the research end of it. We want to bring in research. Uh, there's the educational aspects. There's innovation and thought leadership. So those are the things we want to do. So education, um, of course, we are a university. Uh, are there ways, are there courses that, that the industry needs us to be offering that we're not offering? Um, can we do that? That's one aspect of education. Another is professional education. We offer a number of pro-ed courses but are we offering the right courses? We want to hear what industry needs. Somebody from a major airline uh, told me the other day that they are very interested in learning more about data science, uh, data, data analytics. So I'd like to uh, collaborate with that airline to find out more specifically what it is they want and then see if we can put together um, a, a course, a, a pro-ed course uh, for, for that. So we we really want to be here um, not to serve our own needs, but to serve the needs of, uh, of, of the industry. Good, no, that's, that's great. I think it's uh, certainly something that industry will take advantage of. So uh, Dan, uh, let's, uh, let's get Dan back and see if we've got any questions that have come in from our hundred and some people that are watching us live. There we go. It took a second to, for some reason, uh, the uh, keyboard didn't want to uh, activate. Yeah. I love technology. Uh, we do have questions. Uh, let's get started with one from uh, Tom Judge. Uh, what are the three most important actions that helicopter operators can take to improve safety? Well, Tom, good to hear from you. And thanks for all that you've done there at Life Flight of Maine. And not only there in your own organization, but from an industry-wide perspective, you've made uh, uh, tremendous contributions. I, I would feel a little presumptuous trying to answer that question. I think, frankly, you all in the industry are best postured to do that. And I know that sounds like a weak way out, but um, 
you're the ones that are studying the data uh, and, and living this on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, you know, I could take a shot at it, but I don't think that would, I, I, I think it'd be best not to. I think the work of the US HS, the, the, the US HST and the international HST. And so Jim has the, apparently the name of the, of that has changed. Is that right? The, what used to be the IHST. Yes. Is now the international vertical, uh, vertical aviation safety team or VAST. And then uh, I think, you know, as you were just talking there, sir, you know, the, uh, the, the data, I think, uh, you know, all operators have a, having the ability to uh, collect data or report data or have the culture where somebody can say, Hey, this is wrong without having any type of fear of repercussion because they're reporting something that they want to see improvement in their company. I think that's, that data is important. Yeah. So, you know, was when I was with an airline and we were, uh, uh, I worked sort of part-time, I was on loan uh, a week, a month to work in our focal office. And uh, I mean, boy, we had data coming out of our ears, but the question is, and we'd stare at it. And what is what are these data telling us? And I think that's a real challenge right there. Everybody's collecting data. What are you doing with it? How can it be used to to, be, to best help you? You know, back to Tom's question, something that you said there, Jim, about the non-reprisal policy, a fear of, I'm sorry, of having a comfort in reporting things. I mean, establishing and maintaining a safety culture, a positive safety culture is critical because I, in my opinion, um, a lot hinges on, I was gonna say everything hinges on safety culture, um, but you know, I think that's very important. I think having a, a robust safety management system is important uh, because that gives you the structure for uh, reporting and doing risk assessment or risk management. Um, so I think that, those are two things that would just come off, you know, that, that I would say for any aspect of aviation right there. And how about SMS? Well, I mean, certainly the NTSB uh, was pushing for, uh, for SMS for, for uh, part 135 operators. And I, I believe that's, that's important. If once money is exchanged for goods and services, there is a higher uh, standard of care from a legal point of view, and uh, and you need to make sure. I don't want to sound preachy. You need to make sure, but an operator needs to needs to make sure that they are actively uh, uh, managing their risk. And uh, you know, people take risk management, uh, their eyes glaze, glaze glaze over when you hear that term. But a, a good definition, Jim, I, that I always liked came from the FAA, and it was that uh, we manage risk whenever we modify the way that we do something to increase the chance of, of success or decrease the chance of injury, failure, or loss. And that's really what we're doing. We're trying to look, what are those things out there that can hurt us? How badly can it hurt us? And then what are we going to do to mitigate that? Maybe we don't even get close right. to this thing. And so, uh, and I think in our lives, we, we practice that, uh, on a regular basis, you know, in my apartment in Washington, I would always want to leave out of the south exit because th there was a clear approach to the road. But if I left from the north exit of the parking garage, uh, there was a curve, and there was cars that would park here. And in other words, it was a blind it was a blind exit. So my risk management there, I modified the way that we did something to increase the chances of success or decrease the chances of injury, failure, or loss. So that's that's what I view. Uh, risk management to be in a, in a nutshell. Any thoughts on that, Jim? No, well, that's exactly it. I mean, the cell, and use that example, there's nothing wrong with either exit, but why would you take a higher risk, right? Ex ex exactly. So okay. you're right. Dan, what else? Well, I think you just, I think you just answered uh, Bernard's question. Uh, do you think that SMS has benefited the U.S. airline industry during the time it's been requirement? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I, I mentioned earlier two things that I felt were very important with improving the safety record. And I said uh, uh, technology has helped. And I think I said that the uh, the work of the uh, of the uh, of the cast has helped. And then I think I added one other thing to that list later on. And then uh, and then and so let me add yet another on there. I mean, I, I did acknowledge there's not just one thing. Um, I think one of those things that I added was the introduction of newer technology airplanes. But yes, absolutely. The FAA, as you know, requires uh, 
SMS for Part 121 carriers. And part of that SMS is to is uh, active is uh, active management of uh, of risk. Anytime you're going to change something, you run a change management process. You're looking at okay, how can we screw this up, and and uh, and then how can we prevent ourselves from screwing it up? We have a question from uh, from Jay. Mr. Summel, wonderful to see you back on the helicopter side. Would you care to comment about the effect of just culture in improving reporting veracity in all aspects of aviation safety and aiding in SMS? Well, certainly you've got to have a just culture. I was working with the company, not uh, doing some consulting during the time that I failed retirement from June 30th until January the 4th. And, um, and so I, um, I was doing consult consulting outside um, of the aviation industry, uh, but it was in the transportation industry. And these people had done a, a safety culture survey and they found that their safety culture uh, was not as robust as they wanted it to. And then when I went and looked at the company, uh, you know, I would, I would talk about uh, what is your reporting? And, um, you know, they would, there was discipline involved. Uh, if you screwed something up, uh, you, there, there would be discipline. And uh, I'm like, well, there's, a, there's part of the problem right there. You, a, a, a safety culture and a punitive culture cannot, cannot coexist. And uh, so I think having that just culture is, uh, is, is underpinning your safety culture. Okay, I see we're getting up to the uh, top of the hour. Let's go ahead and wrap it up with one last question. And actually it's for both of you. It's uh, from uh, Jeffrey Gazzetti. He said he worked with, uh, has worked with both of you, admires both of you, and uh, has been with the NTSB and the FAA. Uh, what do each of you miss the most? and the least about your previous government job. Hmm. Jim, I'll okay, let you well, take well, I miss Jeff. I mean, he, he was always a great go-to guy um, in both locations, both the NTSB and the FAA. Uh, but now, I, I, it is, uh, you know, it was one of those tough decisions leaving the FAA to come over to industry. But I, I do think, um, you know, there is a lot of, you know, a lot of constraint with government. And, uh, and I did see that, I mean, and I am trying, you know, as safety, like I said, I want people to understand, I want society to understand that we have a great capability with the vertical lift, um, not only of today, but of the future, and that you have to believe that the helicopters and these vertical aircraft of the future, the EV toll and all are safe. And we have to do our best in the training mode to make them, uh, to make sure they're operated as safe as the OEMs are building them to. So, uh, I think we have, I have more capability to do that here on the industry side. And I'm certainly working my butt off to, to help to get, to bring industry together as well as the governments to working with the FAA uh, and, and working international with the ASA and others, because it is that relationship. Uh, I've just, I just switched sides of the fence, but we're still on the same playing field. And, and knowing, you know, it's kind of like when you're gonna have an audit, you ought to look over the audit yourself before the auditor comes in and shows you what he's gonna audit. So having been in the FAA for 10, 11 years now, and that helps me, I think, on the industry side with that relationship. And hopefully my members uh, are seeing that and, and appreciate it. Over to you, sir. Thank you. And, and I wanna point out that Jeff, uh, Jeff Cassetti is an Embry-Riddle alum, graduated with a degree in uh, aeronautical engineering. And um, I think uh, what I miss the most about uh, working at the NTSB, quite frankly, is, uh, is the people. Um, we, NTSB, when I left, uh, had, uh, uh, at the time I left, had a wonderful uh, general counsel who happens to be married to, to Jeff. And so, but you know, I, I miss, I really miss, I loved the NTSB. I, it was, uh, I loved working there and, uh, and being a part of it. Um, so uh, it was an agency that I, I was always proud to represent the agency itself and the people, uh, very dedicated people there. And, uh, and, and Jeff, at some point, send me an email and tell me what you miss the most about it because uh, you were a star. I think you were at the NTSB, I believe for 28 years. I think. Wow. Anyway. Now, very good. So, you know, I can't let that go without 
thanking the GASA team and the FAA because if they're watching and I didn't say it's the people because it's always the people and hopefully the team here at HAI understands that too that uh, you know if, if uh, all the technology and everything we talked about for safety it comes down to the individuals and it comes down to relationships and and uh, and I love what we're doing and I appreciate all the work you've done to make aviation safety sir and uh, and thank you for coming on here today and uh, again I think you know the passion that you have, the passion that I have, the team at HAI, FAA, NTSB, we're all in it for the right reason and we're all pulling together. And sometimes it doesn't seem that way, but we all want safe aviation. Totally agree. And uh, Jim, crank that R44 up, point it south, come on down to Daytona Beach. We'd love to have you here. All right, I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> that sounds great. Thanks for having me. It's great Thanks. to be here. Thanks. Over to you, Dan. Thank you both. Thank you both for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, certainly appreciate your sharing your time and your knowledge with us. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor. Thanks so much, Dan. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay, let's go ahead and get things wrapped up here this afternoon. If I can find the uh, the right screen here. Technology is not my friend today. Cancel out with that again. This should do it. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, webinars coming up uh, next uh, very soon. Next week we have one uh, avoiding wire strikes. We have. Uh, a person who has experienced a wire strike and uh, will be coming on the show to tell us about it. We have a, an instructor that uh, has been attending HAI Heli Expo and uh, providing classes on avoiding or flying in the wire environment for many years. And we have a company uh, that offers uh, equipment to help avoid, uh, mitigate wire strikes uh, next week. I think that'll be uh, something that's gonna be uh, pretty important to pay attention to. On February 24th, uh, it'll be our last episode before HAI Heli Expo. Um, many of you may not know that uh, we have a series of working groups that uh, really are the backbone of the work that gets done at HAI. They're the ones who are assigned by the board to address uh, any series of issues that are affecting our industry. They research it and they are working on solutions constantly trying to help uh, provide uh, input to not only the, uh, the industry, but to the uh, regulatory bodies as well. Um, each of them usually holds meetings at HAI Heli Expo. And so we're going to have a really rapid fire discussion from, uh, I think, 13 of the uh, chairs. It's going to be uh, real fast. What are they uh, planning on doing during Heli Expo and how you can be a part of uh, those working groups if you're interested. Uh, March 3rd is the week before uh, Heli Expo. We're not going to have a webinar that day or on the 10th, uh, the week of Heli Expo. March 4th and 5th might be something fun for you folks to uh, join. We are going to be doing live streaming from HAI Heli Expo fly-in. It's like our own little private air show. Uh, the aircraft are landing from about 10 a.m. Uh, central to about uh, dusk, 5 p.m., let's call it. Uh, that will vary. Uh, it also depends on the weather. But they're going to be landing about every 20 minutes. And so there will be times where you're just watching um, the landing pad. Nothing will be happening. Uh, grab a sandwich during lunch and uh, tune in and see what you might, uh, might see coming in for a landing. There won't be a lot of commentary. We don't have the, uh, the manpower to do that. We just thought you guys might like to watch and see what's coming in for the show. We do have a survey coming to you very shortly. We do ask that you take just a minute or two to respond. Um, one of the questions we're going to ask is, uh, what would you like to see in upcoming webinars? We do pay very, I pay very close attention to that question. I'm always looking for new ideas. I believe uh, today's subject was one of the questions uh, that, that was asked or uh, brought up, or the topic was brought up. So. Um, obviously, Chairman Sumwalt was kind enough to uh, share his time with us, and we are grateful for that. If you have other thoughts about how HAI could uh, help you, help the industry, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what we could do more of, uh, what we could help to fix that's broken, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Jim Viola asks that you send emails to him at uh, president at rotor.org with your challenges, your suggestions, any comments. He does task the staff with the uh, issues that come in and we try to respond to those quickly. 
That does conclude our webinar for today. We are grateful that you took time out of your schedule to join us, uh, whether it's live or recorded. Uh, we hope that you felt today's topic is valuable and we look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Until then, please be safe and fly safe. Thank you.